Hey, thank you for joining us online today. We are so glad that you joined us. Every week, people uh, from all over the world are watching with us. So we're glad today that you're here with us as we proclaim God's gospel and God's word. Uh, before we get started today, we want to let you know that this sermon is not meant to replace uh, the local and biblical community that you need to be a part of and the local church that you need to be involved in. This uh, sermon is supplemental uh, to you sitting under the care of a local church pastor. Pastor, um, and the care of a local church family. Uh, because Christianity is not about individual persons. It is about a people. It is about the church. So if you live anywhere in around the Middle Tennessee area, we would love for you to join us at one of our local campuses. Um, if you live outside of that area, we would love to connect you to a good church. Uh, if you'll reach out to us through Facebook, through Twitter, Instagram, if you'll email us, we want to help you find a good, healthy, uh, Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church that you can connect to, that you can plug into, and you can find life and live sin. So we want to help you do that. We pray that hope that this sermon and these messages bless you, and you please reach out to us and let us know how we can help. Let's get ready to go back in our series called Jesus in our study of the Gospel of John. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and go. John 6, 16 through 21. Uh, John, John's Gospel is the story of, of Jesus, his whole life. So that's what we're walking through. If you need to catch up on the app, do that this week. Or just get your Bible out and you can read and catch up with us too, which would probably be better. Uh, but what we're doing, uh, we're walking through his life. And this in J uh, February of 2018, or, or 17, sorry, 2017, me and my wife Callie had the privilege um, of spending a week at the Holy Land in Israel. Uh, where Jesus was born, he lived, and he died. We got to experience that uh, topographically uh, from cradle to the cross. Jesus is 33 years on earth, and it was incredible. From the, the place of his uh, supposed birthplace, uh, uh, where it would have been a, like, like a... a, a um, just a barn-like thing and stone, and we watched that happen, and we walked where Jesus walked, and we, we went on the grounds and sat on mountains where Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. We sat on a rock there and, and sat in that presence. And by the way, Jesus preached a lot longer than I do on Sundays, right, on rocks, so no complaining. Uh, so we, we watched that. We watched the, uh, the place of the Garden of Gethsemane. We walked in that where Jesus wept. Right, And we, we sat in the upper room where the Last Supper would take place. We visited the uh, site of the, the skull, the place of Golgotha where Jesus was crucified. We visited the likely tomb of Jesus Christ. We stepped inside of it. We literally uh, walked through the life of Jesus Christ, and it was absolutely incredible. Before I went, everyone said, hey, you'll never be the same, and it'll be the best experience of your life, I have never read my Bible the same since I got back from Israel. It means different things to me, and it will to you as well. It would be the best experience of your life. Um, you need to take advantage of that. There's a lot of ways that you can do that. Specifically, we are in 2019 uh, taking another team from LifePoint Church to Israel. If you want to find out more about that, um, you can contact the church office. Just call the main line, and uh, they'll help you out with that. But one of the places that we went uh, was we took a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee, which is the setting for today's story in John 6, 16 through 21. If you remember where we left off, let me just kind of recap where we, we, when we ended our last session. Uh, Jesus had just fed, uh, the text says 5,000. We know literally that was more like fifteen to 20,000. He had just fed them with a, a can of sardines and a box of cornbread. I mean, he just fed the masses with a little boy's lunch. And uh, he did that, and all the disciples are just like freaking out. Wow, what just happened? All the people, the crowds were like, yes, free food forever. Be our king, right? And Jesus says, no, I don't want to be your king. I've told you over and over again, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is a kingdom of yet to come. I don't want to be your king. And then what does Jesus do? He disappears. He has this propensity for disappearing in crowds, right? Because he's God. So he, did, he does this. And then now we pick up the story today um, where Jesus, uh, he's, the, the disciples get into the boat. 
And they go out into the middle of a storm. They find themselves in a storm. Jesus glides and walks upon the water. He, he speaks to them and calms them. And then they, there's this miracle that they get uh, transferred over to the shore in safety. There's a story that's going on here. But I don't want you to confuse this with the story in Matthew's gospel uh, where Jesus and all his disciples were in the boat together, and Jesus was uh, catching a nap, right? And the storm comes in, and the disciples freak out, and they're shaking Jesus, wake him up, rebuke the storm. That's not this story. This is not the story about you having enough faith when you're in the boat during a storm. This is not the story about you having enough faith to get out of the boat. This is a story about Jesus getting in your boat, In the middle of a storm. Now, if you're tracking with me already, uh, you're going to see what's going on here already. Life is full of storms. Some of you are in a storm right now, and you're already dialed in, and you're already going there with me. Some of you have been in storms, and you remember well what it is like. And some of you have never really experienced a storm. Let's be sure your turn will come. Storms come to all of us. It could be a storm of a bad medical report. It could be a storm of a stormy marriage, a dysfunctional home, dysfunction in finances. All these storms in the life, this is a story about Jesus getting into your boat in the midst of a storm and telling you that it is well. I'm over this. I got this. Trust me. Me, I am God. All right, so let's pray, and then we'll let this text uh, preach to us today. God, thank you for sending your son, for taking on flesh, to come down and walk on this planet Earth. Your feet hit the ground. We have a historically rooted faith, Father. God, you came. And you spent 33 years on this earth. We long to soak up every word you said. To watch everything you did. To learn from you. To absorb all of your teaching. Today, you have a specific teaching that you want us to understand. And it is about you being sovereign over the storms. Father, for the suffering, the hurting today, let this be a profound story that brings not only healing, but brings comfort and purpose and hope and assurance in the middle of what these people may be walking through today. And God, somewhere in this place today, there are people that do not have Jesus in their boat. They think they need more church. And they do not need more church. They need Jesus in their boat. So, Father, would you glide across the water today? And would you draw these people to yourself? We love you. Thank you for Jesus' precious and strong name. We pray. Amen. So, let me set up this story. I often, uh, through John's gospel, have tried to show you pictures that I have taken on our trip And listen, uh, sometimes my pictures are a little fuzzy. My kids make fun of me for taking like dad pics on my phone. They're a little blurry, but I think these are good. So let me show you this first pic. Uh, We got a boat here. So this boat right here was excavated off the shore of the Seas of Galilee not too long ago, and it is dated as over 2,000 years old. This here would have been the type of boat that Jesus and the disciples would have been in in the midst of this storm, right? Clearly, it's incomplete. There's other pieces, but we're talking about a 25-foot wooden boat here uh, that would have been likely what these guys were sitting in. And also, the setting of our story today, let's go to the The Sea of Galilee, overlooking. Now, in this brush here, this field, this would have been the area where they had just fed uh, the the multitudes. And then he overlooking, he sees the Sea of Galilee down there. Uh, Jesus spent the majority of his three years um, in the city of Capernaum, which is on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. So he spent majority of his time doing ministry here and overlooking in the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee uh, was... 
the Sea of Galilee was, um, it was let me get the, d- the demographics here, it's eight miles wide, 13 miles long, all right? It is 600 feet below sea level. So what you had here, because of the, the differences in the elevation, uh, you would have these massive temperature and pressure changes where the, the cold air from the mountains would come down and through these tunnels through the mountains and collide with the warm, moist air on the Sea of Galilee, and it would create these violent winds, these violent hurricane-type storms, these angry waters, and that's typically what happened then, and it still happens like this today. So there's the sea. Uh, for the story. And let's read John 6 and start in verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. They got into the boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. Let's just kind of stop right there and let's pause for just a moment. When the disciples got into the boat that morning, more than likely it was a calm sea. Uh, Majority of the time during the day, the Sea of Galilee is very calm. The storms don't really come till later in the day. So it's very calm. They didn't know what they were getting ready to walk into, right? They didn't have the weather app to check what it was going to be at noon or 8 o'clock at night. They jump into the boat, and it's very calm. They get out of the middle. They row out about three to four miles. Uh, They're four hours in, and they get smacked in the face with this cataclysmic storm. In the middle of the night, the other gospels tell us it was the fourth watch of the night. The Romans kept time by four sections or four watches of the night. So this is in the middle of the night, a cataclysmic storm hits them out of nowhere. Now, sidebar, isn't it always or seem to be always that the worst storms always hit at night when you're like sleeping? Right, We're at home, we're sleeping so good, and out of the blue, the thunder just kind of starts rolling through, the, the hail and the rain is peppering your windows, the wind is traveling through your home like a train. You, you freak out, you wake up, you turn on the TV, and the weather lady's going crazy, right? Hide your kids, hide your wife, get in the tub, give them a kiss, your mama's calling you, are you okay there, right? All these things that are going on in the middle of the night. It just always seems that way. It's not just the natural storms. There's also some metaphorical storms that we experience in the middle of the night as well, right? Doesn't it always seem that a stomach virus hits in the middle of the night, right? You're puking, you're crawling on the ground to the white porcelain god, and you're calling out to Earl. Your eyes are popping out of your head, right? No one wants a phone call in the middle of the night. Those are dangerous, right? Is it, who's on the phone? There's been a car accident, Someone's in the hospital. Someone needs bail money. Someone's, someone needs rescue. You don't want to answer that phone in the middle of the night. But it is in the middle of the night that we often find these storms. And for these disciples, they had just witnessed this epic miracle of the feeding of the multitudes. And now they are in need of another epic miracle. They are destined uh, to be swimming with the fishes here very shortly. And these are very experienced fishermen. They're in a very volatile state of certain death. This is like uh, Deadliest Catch. We got any Deadliest Catch fans in the room? Yeah, you watch it. You know what I'm talking about. So except for this, they're in the middle of that, but they're in a 25-foot wooden boat with oars, tired disciples who had just finished feeding fifteen to 20,000 people. Like they were waiting on them, the waiters. Of 15 to 20, so they're tired, and they're in the middle of this storm, and they're just at a loss. They're hopeless. They have no opportunity. They're rowing as hard as they can, and they're going nowhere. All right, so let's pick up the story, because here's the, you know that they must be thinking this. These are faithful followers of Jesus, right? Faithful followers of Jesus. Why would they be in the center of the storm if I'm in the center of his will? Why us? Why us? Now, here's where we're going to spend a bulk of our practical application today, because I think we can learn a lot about the storms that these disciples are in, because we are in a life that our life is full of storms. Always. We are in a stormy world. Ever since Adam and Eve stiff-armed God in the garden, life is full of storms. We cannot avoid them in any way, shape, or form. Now, some of the storms that we a walk through in, night, in life are a result of our own sin, 
We, are, we create these storms in our own life because of our broken sin in the world. For those that are in Christ, the sin debt has been paid. There is no penalty for your sin. God took the sin record of yours and he took it and he put it in Jesus' hands and he drove a nail right through it. So there is no penalty for you, but sin still does bring consequences in this life. Storms, stormy marriages where there are still a husband and wife battling for authority. Stormy marriages where one of the spouses is settling for a counterfeit virtual sex instead of the good gift that God has given them for each other. Stormy homes where kids are rebelling. They want to be their own little gods. They don't want to listen to you and they don't want to listen to the Lord. Stormy marriages that have been fractured already through separation or divorce. Financial storms when we do not spend God's money right. Storms in our body when we misuse food, alcohol, and medication. We create many of the storms in our own life. We are little storm producers. But that's not what's going on in this story. You see the text. How did they get in this mess? Violent winds, suffering, worry, anxiety, terror, hopeless. How did they get into this situation? We don't see it in John's gospel, but in Matthew and Mark, the other synoptic gospels, it does tell us how they got in the situation. Look with me in Matthew 14, verse 22. Let me read this. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. Now, here's what I want you to see. The disciples were not in this situation because they were unwise, because they were unfaithful, because they were disobedient. They were in this situation because they were obeying the clear call of Christ. He told them to get into the boat. All they were doing was what Jesus told them to do. I'm obeying Jesus, and yet this is happening to us. And you know the storm is not happenstance, right? Who's the commander of the storm that's coming? It's Christ. Christ is sovereign over Storms. Look at Psalm 89 9. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Jesus is not reacting to the storm. He's not allowing the storm. He's not interceding at the storm. He's orchestrated the storm. He has planned this storm for his beloved. Why? I think it's a fair question. I think we would stop right here and say, why would a loving God, a merciful God, a delivering God, why would that God put his beloved in the middle of a storm? I thought he loved us. I thought he was the great deliverer. Doesn't he want to be to stay away from storms? Not really. Let's dive in a little bit. Why would we do this? Well, first of all, Jesus knows the hearts of his disciples. Jesus knows the heart of his disciples, and he knows how self-confident we are. He knows we have this great ability for self-reliance, self-dependence, independent world. He knows how we are. He knows our selfish hearts. So here's what God will do. God will do something like this by putting you in a storm to teach you something that he would not normally be able to teach you outside of the storm. He puts you in situations that you normally would not go on your own to teach you something that you cannot accomplish on your own. That's what's happening. He's put them in the middle of the storm. Now, it's a stormy world for all disciples. Always has been. No pain, no gain, no cross, no crown, no suffering, no Inheritance, that's the way it is for us, and that's the way it's always been. It's the way it was for Jesus' disciples, right? 
12, all of them except for John, who would get exiled, died a martyr's death, boiled, persecuted, beheaded for obeying the clear call of Christ. Why would I think that I would not have a storm in my life? It is in the midst of a storm that God teaches. Now, here's where we've got to be careful to not fall prey to the modern-day gospel. The modern-day gospel says, you are precious, you are worthy, God sees great potential in you, He loves you, and you should consider inviting Him into your heart because He will bless your life and He will make you healthy and wealthy and He will always keep you safe. Don't ever listen to the brother who preaches that gospel to you. You run from that brother. Because the biblical gospel says you are unworthy. You are hopeless. You have nothing to offer to God. And that you actually need to die, pick up a cross to follow Jesus. There's nothing safe about following Jesus, right? There's nothing safe about following a man who gets up on a cross and says, do what I do. There's nothing safe about that. Following Jesus is often us going in the middle of the storm. Storms are not the absence of God's power. They are the very presence of God's power. So where's the good news in that? Right? Where's the good news in my suffering? Why is this loving God taking me through? Why is he wounding me? You might say that today. Why is he scarring me? Why is he bruising me, taking me through? Here's the good news from Paul in Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Please underline all things. All things means all things, not some things. Listen, because God is sovereign, nothing has befallen in your life today, in your circumstances, that is first not passed through his hands. All things. And in that sovereignty, Paul says that God is going to use it for your good and for his glory. From one degree to the next, he says in 2 Corinthians, he is going to make you more like Christ through your suffering. And that is the good in all things. Anything that makes you more like Jesus is good for you. It doesn't feel good. Like, God, I know you're good, but this is not feeling good right now. Paul says, yes, it's for your good because it makes you more like Christ. It carves at you, it shapes you, and molds you, and that's painful. So how does a loving God send you to the storms? Because in those moments where he wounds you and he hurts you and he bruises you, he's making you more like Jesus. And for him to take his hands off of you, to not wound you, to not scar you, would actually be an unloving thing to deprive you of more of him. Now this is why we have to stay rooted in this, because if you fall prey to the modern gospel, when the storms come, you're gone. You'll leave Jesus because he didn't work out for you. He didn't deliver on his promise. And you'll leave the church. I've seen too many people come through here expecting the health and the wealth and the goodness to follow Jesus, the blessing of the Lord. And if something smacks him in the middle of the face, cancer, a broken relationship, it's not working out for us, this is too painful, and they are gone, disappeared. When we can shore up and we understand what the storms are for and why God would use those, then we don't get our legs swept out from numbers. We don't fall prey. Now, what we're seeing in here is Jesus is not only sending you into the storm, he's using the storm for your good and for his glory. That's what we're studying and we're seeing here. Now, 
you, some of you maybe heard of a band called Shane and Shane. Uh, Shane and Shane, Christian band, uh, the, one of the singers in the band, Shane Barnard, he, um, he got some, some devastating news a few years ago. And his uh, father, he got a call from his uh, mother that his father actually had a heart attack. And uh, upon visiting him in the hospital and weeping and crying, and uh, the Lord called him and took him, and he passed away. And um, Shane is just in this devastating moment. He is the guy that's saying, why God? Why this storm? Why right now? I know you're good, but this doesn't feel good. Why are you doing this? Um, and it is this moment that the song called, Though You Slay Me, was born. And some of you might know this song. Uh, it is the song of Job. Job lived this song. The, songs, the psalms plead this song. Listen to the words and let this song, let the words of this song wash over the wounded that are in this room today. Listen. I come, God, I come. I return to the Lord, the one who's broken the one who's torn me apart. You strike down to bind me up. You say you do it all in love, that I might know you and your suffering. Though you slay me, yet I will praise you. Though you take from me, I will bless your name. Though you ruin me, still I will worship. Sing a song to the one who's all I need. My heart and flesh may fail. The earth below give way. But with my eyes, with my eyes, I'll see the Lord. Lifted high on that day, behold the lamb that was slain. And I'll know every tear was worth it all. Though you slay me, yet I will praise you. Though you take from me, I will bless your name. Though you ruin me, still I will worship. Sing a song to the one who's all I need. Man, in the storms, very simple, simply put, Jesus is teaching us that he is God and he is enough and he is all we need. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said. They who dive in the sea of affliction bring up rare pearls. So I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. Church, brothers and sisters, learn to kiss the wave that throws you up against the rock of Jesus. Do not waste your storm. Let's pick up the rest of the story in 19. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. I bet they were glad to take him in the boat, right? And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Now, there at the end, I'm not going to unpack this, but many believe that is another miracle of Jesus. He gets in the boat, and then immediately they're on safe shores, right? Uh, so I believe that as well. I read some different interpretations, but uh, that's not where we're going to focus in on this. What we want to see here is you have this violent storm uh, brewing. They are tired. They're broken. The violence of the waves is crashing them up, throwing them against the rock. They're, all these things are going on. And then in the midst of the storm, uh, they see uh, Jesus walking on the water, right? Making footprints on the water, coming to them um, in the middle of the night. Now, the other synoptic gospels say they saw and they thought it was a ghost. All right? Now, here's what I want you to understand uh, they were frightened by the ghost, but here's what I want you to understand. They weren't, they weren't frightened because they thought they saw a ghost in per se that they didn't recognize Jesus. They thought it was a ghost because the person coming at them was walking on water and no mortal man had ever done that before. So it wasn't that they, ooh, I don't know if that's Jesus or not. I can't. They, they, did, they knew, they probably recognized Jesus, but he's walking on water and no mortal man did that. So why were they frightened? They were frightened because they're seeing God for who he is. And as he walks on the water, 
Here is John's fifth sign, right? Fifth miracle, John calls them signs. What is he doing? Why is he walking on water? Because he's showing off his godness. He's saying, I am the commander of all creation. The laws of nature bow down to me. I rebuke storms. I call out to the rain, fall, and I tell it where and when to fall. I tell the snowflake when to come, where it's hit. And every single snowflake that hits the ground, I hear it. We don't believe in Mother Nature. All right? So if we don't believe in Mother Nature, let's not talk about Mother Nature. Are you tracking? Like when the storm's bad, don't, don't say, well, Mother Nature this, Mother... No, we're Christians. We don't believe in Mother Nature. We believe the sovereignty of God commanding all of the winds, the waves, the rain, the snow, everything. It is God who commands those things. And he is displaying as Jesus Christ... His deity, his godness, his authority over creation. Now, he comes up on them, and he says only two things to them in this this whole text. He says two things, but they're very profound things. He says, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now, so we don't blow past this and just say, oh, he just comes up and says, it's me. I'm here. It is I. In the Greek means ego nimi, which means I am. So Jesus rolls up on the boat, comes up to me, says, I am. Now, why is that significant? Sounds a little weird, right? I am? Okay, great. What up? Remember back in Exodus when Moses was debating with God at the burning bush? You want me to go back to Egypt and plead before Pharaoh? Who am I supposed to say sent me? And God's God's response, he said, I am who I am. So in this moment, Jesus is declaring his deity. He's saying, I am is here. I am the great I am, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, the God of all creation from history, from beginning to end. I am is here with you. It's going to be all right, boys. I'm God, and I'm here. That's what he's saying in this text. And if that God gets into your boat, it's going to be okay. Right? But they don't know that yet. Remember, they're still in a, in a paralysis of fear. It's still there in terror. Why are they in terror? Once again, it's because they're seeing Jesus for who he is. That's the terror. They're not freaking out over an apparition, a a, a ghost. They're saying, whoa, we see Jesus as he is, and that is a terrifying thing to them. Why is that terrifying? Why would they fear Jesus? Because when human man and woman stand before Jesus Christ and truly see him for who he is, holy, perfect, blameless, Judge over the living and the dead, we buckle in fear. In terror, we see Jesus for who he is. And that's what they're doing in this moment. Listen, there's a God that we can't fathom in this world. But he is a God that is going to be feared. He is a God that will one day come back to judge the living and the dead, to right all wrongs. And there will be people who do not know Jesus as Lord, and they will tremble in terror. And it will be too late. But for those who profess Jesus as Lord, surrender their life, glad submission, hand it over to Christ, he looks at you and says, do not be afraid. I'm with you. It is okay. You don't have to fear me anymore. As the glory of the stars can only be seen in the pitch blackness of the night, the glory of Jesus Christ can only be seen in the backdrop of a terror before a holy Jesus. You can't glide into Jesus and think he's this fairy, this grace fairy, he's this imaginary, he's friendly, he's a bubbly dude. You can't do that. You can't come at Jesus like that. You first have to see Jesus for who he is, and you have terror, and you tremble. And when you truly see him like that, that is when he says, do not be afraid. And that is what the 
disciples are experiencing in this moment. Now, here's what I want you to know. Let me come back to the storms that might be in your life right now. I don't know how big they are. I don't know how small they are. But typically, when we have storms in our life, they're all big because there are storms, right? There's nothing that you are walking through today. Nothing. Nothing in your marriage, in your home, at your job, in your personal life, your mind. Nothing going on in any of those realms is outside of the sovereignty of God and is beyond God's power to demonstrate in the middle of your storm. He can use it for your good and for his glory. The God who split the sea, who formed a people, the God who raised Lazarus from the dead, the God who fed 5,000. When that God gets in your boat, it is going to be good. It's going to be all right. And that's what we're learning. The question would be then, is Jesus in your boat? Is he in your family's boat? Have you ever, as as Jesus called you to himself, it is I, do not be afraid. Have you ever given yourself over to that and like given up on yourself to be in the boat, to fight the storms on your own? Have you ever laid down and said, Jesus, I want you in my boat. I pray that you do today. And as we respond in just a moment, I want to set up a story to read with you today that is a story about a man named Horatio Spafford. And Horatio Spafford was uh, a prominent businessman in the 1800s. He was also a Presbyterian elder. He loved the Lord. Uh, Family of five, his wife named Anna. And in the year uh, 1871, uh, tragedy struck his family. He lost a two-year-old son to pneumonia. Later that year, the great Chicago fire Uh, ruined everything for his family, took away his home and most of his real estate. Storms. Someone told him, hey, man, you should probably get away. You should probably go on a vacation just to kind of get away. And he did. He gathered up his four daughters and his wife, Anna, and he put them on a boat. He put them on an English vessel heading over to London. He says, you go out ahead of me. I'm going to stay back. I got some work to do. I'll meet you over there in three days. Two days later, an English vessel crashed into the ship where his daughters and his wife were. He received a telegram from his wife that said this, Ship down, I'm alone. He lost all of his daughters. They sunk to the bottom of the sea. Hopeless, discouraged, brokenhearted. Why God gets into a ship to go meet his wife, Anna. On the journey, he goes across the ocean, and he gets to the place in the ocean where his daughters perished, where they went down on the water. He calls out to the captain, Captain, would you drop the anchor here at this place? And he sat down, weeping. Why, God? Why, God? And it is in this moment, Penn took to paper and wrote one of the most incredible, amazing hymns that blesses the people of God today. He said this, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. 